been a while since we've seen each other. So, hello. And welcome back. Tonight, we're going to be having a very special episode. All Hallow's Eve. It's a Halloween episode. So if you have any children that you want to keep away from horror movies, from horror parties, from Halloween parties, just from Halloween in general, please have them leave the room and we will continue this, all right? Have they left the room? All right, I'll wait for more seconds. All right, are they all gone? Okay, well, then we can get started. I was walking down the hallway and I knew that there was some problems going on in, in a room. There was this person in the room that was on his third day of not drinking. And if anybody knows what a drunkard is, a drunkard is somebody who continues to drink alcohol to where their brain cells are saturated in alcohol and they're moving very slow. And as the days wear off, their brain molecules do a pendulum effect and start moving very, very fast. And it can cause a heart attack and cause seizures. We call those the delirium tremors. Well, this was about the third day coming on, and, and so I, I knew that there was maybe something going to be going on in this room since I seen the crowd go over there. So I got over to the room, and I seen a low, low blood pressure. And I saw a bag of blood hanging from the uh, IV pole. And when you have a bag of blood hanging from an IV pole and a low blood pressure, you know that they are expecting a bleed to be going on in a patient. So as I watched a little bit, I watched this man start tanking into what we would call a code situation. So immediately we got the pads put on this person. Immediately he was being set up for intubation. I watched his arm rise up and us have to hold his arm down. And I watched as we went to intubate this patient. So as this person was trying to be intubated, a bunch of blood just came up out of his mouth. It was such a copious amount of blood that came out of this mouth that I immediately thought of this season that we're going to be watching these horror movies and the blood just spewing. And yes, I've seen blood before and I've seen people very traumatized, but this situation, my mind went elsewhere. This situation, I wasn't the person's nurse. I didn't know if this person knew Jesus or not. I didn't know if this person was a Christian. So as we're taking care of this patient and the blood's just coming out of his mouth, I'm doing CPR on this patient. Another nurse is doing CPR on this patient because it took three rounds of CPR on this patient. They got the intubation tube in, it was, it was in, and we were bagging them. We didn't even get the ventilator hooked up. And the code was called, the man died. The man had blood all over his face. He had blood all over his chest. And I thought, this man's next state of consciousness is going to be worse than what he just experienced. I watched the person in the room lay a rosary on his chest after we got him cleaned up. But the Bible says, once to die, and then the judgment. So as we head into this Halloween season, Halloween, if people don't quite know what Halloween is, it comes right after All Saints Day, or maybe right before All Saints Day. I don't remember which one is which. Both of them are secular holidays. Both of them have no place in a Christian's life. But this time of Halloween, when you work in the medical field, it's a time that people seem to let loose and they seem to do things that they don't normally do. And we get people coming in who are all cut up, who've been in fights, who've been drunk and, and almost ran over by cars. And, and in fact, one Halloween, our math teacher in high school was at a huge Halloween party and he picked up the legs 
and handed them to the ambulance driver of a man who got ran over by a train. So we have this thing where we go out and we dress our kids up nice and cute, but they still interact with those that don't quite understand. And we train our children to do likewise. And we say, oh, it's just a child's play. It's just a cute little thing we do. Well, then I'd have to ask the question, why as a nurse are we dressing up in the hospital during Halloween if it's just a cute little kid's holiday? And with that dress up, we still dress up as devils and witches and even prostitutes. I can remember as a little small child going to a church Halloween parties. One year I went as the devil, and another year I went as a vampire. I loved vampires. The world has mixed into the church, and the church has mixed into the world. This shirt says hell is horrible. Hell is horrible. You know, we get all these demons and zombies and things from the idea of what's in hell. And we go out as Christians and celebrate this holiday. In fact, the word holiday in America came from the word holy day. So where does this holy day come from? I'm going to let you do your own research on what and where Halloween comes from. The trick or treat, where did that come from? But more importantly, I want to ask you as Christian parents, what are we doing with our children? What are we allowing our children to do when they go to school? Now you could say, they could bully my child for standing up for righteousness. But didn't Jesus say that we're going to be persecuted because he was already persecuted? Doesn't the Bible say, what does godliness have to do with the ungodly? What does the righteous have to do with the unrighteous? Are we going to believe the Bible? Are we going to be doers of the word and not just hearers of the word? Are we going to celebrate Satan trying to defeat Jesus at the cross? Are we going to celebrate the beaten body, the torn flesh, the Jesus that was put into the grave and not risen? Are we going to be celebrating death? Didn't Jesus say he was the light of the world? In him was life. So I'm coming to you today and I'm compelling you to come out from the world, to be separate from the world, to not go along with the pagan practices of the world. It's cute, you say. I go back to that cuteness. The same cute child that you are sending into the holiday with the pagans are going to be introduced to the zombie, to the bloodsuckers. It's very, very interesting that the Bible says stay away from the blood. Don't drink the blood. But yet vampires, zombies, werewolves, everything that has to do with blood is exalted on Halloween. You know, there's a fleshly desire in man. There's a fleshly desire that wants to go scare people. They think it's fun. There's a fleshly desire to, to hide in a coffin and as people walk past, open it up and say, boo. And then we all cheer. And, and I'm going to tell you that, that that's a fleshly desire. But Jesus said, 
that the flesh cannot please God. Am I saying I'm taking away some of your fun? Well, the Bible strictly says the deeds of the flesh are lying, sexual immorality, stealing, reveling, drunkenness, all these things the flesh loves. Paul in the book of Romans says, those things I do I, I should not, and those things I should do I do not. Does that mean you continue in your sin? Paul tells us to walk by the Spirit so we do not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Christianity is not taking fun away. So how many of us who watch horror films in our youth, how many of us have nightmares? How many of us still going through a dark alley have memories of what goes on in that horror film? If we're out on our grandpa's farm and we go to the work shed with all the, the knives and the saws, how many of us have a thought in the back of our head of all the stupid people that go into those buildings when the killer's on the loose? How many of us have woken up from dreams and saying, where did those come from? Those things hang on to us. Those things are implanted in our mind. And unless God miraculously takes away our memory, those things are implanted there. Your little child who is going to go through the streets are going to see blood. They're going to see guts. And if they're close to what you call a pub crawl that's going on during that same time, they could actually see men dressed up as penises and women dressed up as vaginas. Do you want your kids to be part of that? Why do we take our children and throw them into slavery, bondage to being scared, to being petrified, when they could walk victorious? We could explain to them that Jesus has set us free from sin, from death. You know, most of that revolves around death. Most of that revolves around the fear of dying. And even the greatest Christians, I believe, go to their death fighting the fear of death. There are many that stand strong in the faith of Jesus Christ like Stephen, who's staring up into heaven while he was getting stoned, saw Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. And we hear the martyrs that were at the stake who were about ready to be burnt and them saying, this fire will only last for minutes, but the fires of hell last for eternity. There is a place that Christians come to when we're excited that we're going to be going home to see Jesus. But there's a place called hell that those that do not know and believe upon the name of Jesus Christ. That's not just head knowledge because the demons believe and they tremble, but that's a life knowledge. That's a life of living for Jesus, trusting in Jesus. I trust that this chair can hold me, so I'm going to sit in it. Paul says, show me a man with faith and I'll show you a man with works. I trust in this chair. If I did not trust in this chair, I wouldn't sit in it. Trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ entails allowing His Spirit to live in and through us. So going back to this man, lying on this bed, he's all bloody. Monitor is a systole, making a buzzing noise. It's a warning for us making a buzzing noise because it says he's doing zero breaths per minute. He's pale, he's cold, and we have to clean him up because his family's going to come in to see him. And all I can think about is this man opening his eyes in eternity, wishing he could go back even to that point where he's raising his hands up before we put the paralytic in, knowing that this tube is going to go down his throat. All I can think about is this man opening his eyes in hell and being like the rich man begging for a drop of water. 
All I can think about is the torments that the Bible talks about in this man being there. It's a hard, hard situation. If I were to know that this man made a choice in good conscience not to follow Jesus, it'd be a lot easier. If I were to know that this man was taught the real gospel of Jesus Christ, how he breaks the chains that bind people, how he breaks the chain of addictions, how he breaks the chains of alcoholism, how he breaks the chains of sexual immorality, how he says a man must be born again if you were born to be a drunkard or sexually immoral. The Bible says you must be born again. A lot have gone through my mind in the last days. The nightmare of seeing the blood come from this man's mouth, showing that all of his life is coming out of him. Life is in the blood. And that he was going to wake in an eternity where that blood's not needed. And then after we had him cleaned up and the family came and paid their last respects, then the mortuary man came in. And as he came in, we grabbed this cold, cold, clammy, pale, lifeless body. And we picked him up and we put him on the small gurney. And oh, how this funeral director's helper has to be thinking, I wonder where this man is going in eternity. You know, God does give us strength to deal with death on a continual basis. And God has put me in a position to where I'm able to introduce the Jesus Christ who saves, sanctifies, and delivers people. And they don't even have to be my patients. Sometimes I'm called into rooms and someone will say, Ronald will pray for them. But there's a time that each man is going to have to face the judgment. There's a time that each man and woman and child is going to die and face the Almighty God. And it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. We're living in a day where what I'm talking about, it's uncommon. It's not even correct, they say, for me to be talking like I do. God told Ezekiel, he said, the watchman is put on the wall and if the watchman sees the sword coming and he doesn't warn the wicked of the sword and the sword takes his life, then the blood of the wicked man is on the watchman's hands. And the Bible says, if the watchman sees the wicked and warns the wicked of their wicked ways and the sword comes and he repents, and the sword takes his life, then that soul is saved. But then there's another man who when that watchman sees as being wicked and he warns him of his wickedness and that wicked man does not turn from his wicked ways, then the watchman can wash the blood from his hands. But the blood and the wickedness will be required of that man. You see, I watched that man die, and I did my duties as a nurse to keep him alive. Is his blood going to be on my hands? I don't know. I'm going to tell you the truth. I do not know if that man's blood is going to be on my hands. I was in that room. That man was alive, but tanking. And because I'm expected to, I'm doing my duty to save his life. I'm not beating myself up on if I should have witnessed to the man or not because I, I have the faith that if, if God needed someone to speak up, that I would have spoke up. I have that confidence. But still, there's a little thing in the back of my head called a devil's dart. And he just throws it. And it's tinging off of my helmet of salvation. And I'm kind of kidding you there, because in the Word of God, the fiery dart is a javelin. And I have a suit of armor and a shield 
If it was just a dart, it might stick in the capillaries. But it's a javelin that the enemy throws. And without the shield of faith and the armor behind it, the enemy could attack. In these last few days, the enemy's been attacking hard, and I haven't known what to do with it. I knew I was supposed to give a message about it, but it has kept me very quiet. I've been a little bit on the outside because God wants me to tell you that if you don't warn the wicked of their wickedness, their blood's on your hands. Every Christian is to do the work of the evangelist. Every Christian is to judge fruit. Every Christian is the disciple. It's just not the evangelist's job. In fact, how many evangelists have you ever heard stand up and say the things I'm saying? You will get street preachers out there that are bold and that will say the things that I'm saying. And people will cast them off and say that they're awful, that Jesus wouldn't do that. Did Jesus go up to the prostitute and say, go and sin no more? Did he say at the woman at the well? Did he say to you? Did he say to her, you are lying to me? You're living in sexual immorality? Did Jesus speak harshly to the Pharisees? And then we always get Jesus only spoke harshly to the religious. Well, each one of us who are living in sin and thinking that we're getting to heaven is religious. Each one of us that are thinking we're going to get to heaven by living in our sin because grace is going to cover it, we are religious. We have a religion. We don't have a relationship with Jesus. We don't have a relationship that says, Jesus, live in and through me. We have a religion that says, I'm saved by grace. And Paul even says, should I sin that grace may abound. And he says, God forbid. And even in your other translations, it says, may it never be. So I want to encourage you today. I want to encourage you today to think about what you have seen in this video, to think about the horrors that you have just seen in your thought process of saying, I appreciate him telling me to get my kids out of here. Then I want you to think about sending them out this Halloween. When I was in Bible college, we spent Halloween praying for the lost, interceding for the lost. We spent Halloween interceding that the demons that are allowed to come out and live in through people wouldn't be allowed to do damage. What are you going to be doing this Halloween? And more than that, what are you going to do about the sin you're living in or the sin that your neighbor's living in or your children is living in. Are you going to warn them? Or are you going to sit back and say, it's all cute? It was a sobering show today, but hell is horrible. I want a nation to be blessed by God. And the only way we can do that is to exalt the name of Jesus, to lift his name high, to say, Jesus, America needs you. Didn't I tell you that this was going to be a special episode? That was pretty wild, right? Uh, look, I'm not going to wait for the car. Look, we here at the Hub, we here at Anchor Ministries, we shoot live. Yes, a car just rode by. You might even hear somebody drive by and call me an idiot. But that's all right, because we're going to keep it on camera, because we keep everything fresh here until we go. But right now we are. Uh, again, I just wanted to tell you, see all the horns, what's going on down there? Not answering. But anyway, what I want to tell you is, we here at Anchor Ministry truly believe in sharing the gospel. 
And I don't know if you know this, but only 2% of Christians go out and share their faith. So that's a lot of people who aren't hearing the gospel and who are going to die and wake up in hell because we didn't take it upon ourselves to want So be a hero. Be the hero the world needs but doesn't want. That's a hero. Be out there and minister to people, spread the gospel, tell them about Jesus Christ, and not be ashamed of that. Or he'll be ashamed of you. But go share the gospel. Even if you're ashamed or afraid to speak to anybody, or afraid to speak, get some tracks. Give people tracks. One thing I do, I go into the beer stores and I slide tracks into the cases of beer. So when the dude gets home going, I can't wait to open this cold fruit ski up. And he opens it up. Hey, there's a track. I wonder what this says. Do you know Jesus? So there you go. So, one, the best thing to do is to share the gospel again. Only two percent of Christians share their faith. And if you just don't have that kind of momentum yet to go out and speak to people, tracks always work. Make sense too. So God bless you. Thanks again. And thank you for watching. Anchor Ministries here, live. At the hub. We're not really live though, but right now I'm live. Thank you. Where am I? It's dark. There's a lot of people that speak about after death experiences. Can't see anything. Can't see. Wait, there's a light. There's a light. I'll go to the light. I'll go to the light. Where am I? It's dark. Can't see anything. Where am I? It's dark. Can't see anything. Can't see anything. Where am I? Can't see anything. Can't see. There's a light. There's a light. I'll go to the light. I'll go to the light. And they all say they went to a tunnel that was headed for the light. Where am I? Wait, there's a light. There's a light. I'll go to the light. I'll go to the light. But the Bible says that for those who don't receive Jesus as Savior, it goes into outer darkness.